Hey everyone, Father Lane here. Welcome to another class in our course in the Pauline Letters. And today we have come to beautiful Phoenix, Arizona for the rare outdoor game with the roof open during the daytime. Normally it's really hot in the desert, but in late March the weather is just perfect. Similarly, the weather in Crete, where Paul writes his letter to Titus, is often sunny and beautiful. While the topography is quite different, Crete is an island with many beaches, Phoenix, of course, is a desert, you can certainly enjoy many an outdoor afternoon of sunshine. The same questions we've already dealt with regarding authenticity. Was this letter written during the lifetime of the historical St. Paul or was it written later? These same questions arise also in Titus, so we're not going to rehash them. But for today's agenda, we will deal with some of the other diachronic questions that face this letter uniquely, and then we'll delve into a synchronic survey, an outline like we usually do, and then we'll look at a few theological ideas that come up in Titus. Let's begin with the diachronic questions. And the conversation begins right here in the fifth verse of the letter. Paul writes, For this reason I left you in Crete, so that you might set right what remains to be done and appoint presbyters in every town, as I directed you, on condition that a man be blameless, married only once, with believing children who are not accused of licentiousness or rebellious. So you can see here the letter is set probably during the third missionary journey. We know from the other letters, especially 2 Corinthians, that Titus is a key co-worker with Paul on that third missionary journey. According to the letter, Titus has gone now to Crete and Paul writes this letter to him to give him instruction about how the church there should be structured and how to maintain harmony within the Christian church on the island of Crete. Now again, is this happening in the 60s, towards the end of Paul's life, or is this set during Paul's lifetime, but in fact written a few decades afterwards? That's a question that breaks down, as we've discussed before, on a number of different factors, and scholars continue to hotly debate the question. Let's also look at another couple of verses, also in the first chapter, which delves into the dynamic of the Christian church on the island of Crete. We're in verse 10. For there are also many rebels, idle talkers and deceivers, especially the Jewish Christians. And then the letter goes on to say, one of them, a prophet of their own, once said, Cretans have always been liars, vicious beasts, and lazy gluttons. That testimony is true. Therefore, admonish them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith. Cretans have always been liars, vicious beasts, and lazy gluttons. That quotation actually goes back to classical literature a good 600 years before the time of Christ. So it's kind of ironic that that is being said of a prophet of Crete. But this does tell us that there are many problems in the church on Crete. Here, the Jewish Christian community within the church is singled out, so we can infer that we have both a Jewish and a Gentile group of Christians, and that there are challenges on both sides, but especially within Jewish Christianity. I want to draw your attention to a significant detail toward the end of this passage, that they may be sound in the faith. I mentioned this in passing in an earlier class, but I want to draw your particular attention to this right here, the faith, that use of the article before the noun faith. The idea that faith has become institutionalized, that it is the faith. Here Paul accentuates more of what later theologians would call the fides quae creditur rather than the fides qua creditur. We use this distinction in fundamental theology. The fides quae creditur refers to the objective content that is believed. Fides quae creditur, faith which is believed. It's in contrast to the fides qua creditur, which is the faith by which it is believed. That is the subjective adherence of faith. Subsequent theologians would identify that we need to have both of these dimensions of faith to in fact have an authentic faith. So we can see here the development of theology here in this letter to Titus. Let's look at our epistolary elements. And as we've seen with the other pastoral letters, there's a lot of question marks here. We can only identify so much. As we've seen before, the sender is Paul, but authenticity is disputed. The addressee is named Titus. It's set to be the longtime companion of Paul, but again, scholars will question whether that is in fact the case or not. So that brings us to our synchronic survey of the letter. In this letter, we're going to see that there are two preoccupations. Refuting opponents, identified by the letters B here in this outline, and instructing those who are already part of this Cretan church. I want to draw your attention first to chapters 2, verses 1 through 10, which deals with matters internal to the Cretan church. And then in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, you can see 
matters that deal with how does the Cretan church deal externally? How does it situate itself within its larger context? Let's delve now into the theology of this letter, and I'm going to call your attention to that first main block, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Speaking to Titus, it says, As for yourself, you must say what is consistent with sound doctrine, namely that older men should be temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, love, and endurance. Notice here this focus on sound doctrine, didaskalia in Greek. What Paul is going to do here in these first 10 verses of the chapter is instruct how each subgroup of the Cretan church ought to live. Here he's talking about older men, but then he's going to talk about younger men, then he's going to talk about women, and we're going to see it's not quite as strong as what we saw in 1 Timothy, but the focus is everyone should live according to his or her assigned role within that culture. And the same interpretive questions we saw in 1 Timothy arise also here in Titus. Now I want to show you what Paul says about slaves. We pick up in verse 9. Slaves are to be under the control of their masters in all respects, giving them satisfaction, not talking back to them or stealing from them, but exhibiting complete good faith, so as to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every way. For the grace of God has appeared, saving all, and training us to reject godless ways and worldly desires, and to live temperately, justly, and devoutly in this age, as we await the blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice again here, Paul, as he's done also in Ephesians and elsewhere, assumes that slaves are going to remain as such. Paul is not interested in in challenging the larger structure of the Roman Empire. And a case could be made, well, why not, Paul? Why didn't you? We can say for Paul that he's concerned about the viability of the church and the viability of the spreading of the gospel. But we should not interpret this to mean that the church should never advocate for social causes, that the church should never advocate for the downtrodden. Like we saw in 1 Timothy, here we have a message that's written to a specific church at a specific time. We need not infer from that it applies to all churches at all times. That said, we should pay attention to what theological warrant Paul gives for his claims. Notice that use of the conjunction for, gar in Greek. This explains why Paul is giving this advice that he's given in the first 10 verses of chapter 2. And notice what he said, the grace of God has appeared. We read verses 11 through 14 of Titus chapter 2, at midnight mass every year on Christmas. The grace of God has appeared, saving all. So notice here, Paul is very optimistic. Optimistic that salvation can indeed touch all, but that this salvation requires concomitant action. We must reject godless ways and worldly desires and live temperately, justly, and devoutly in this age as we await the blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice we have this word appeared. We have the verb appeared in verse 11, and we have the noun appearance in verse 12. This is what Gorman calls living between the two epiphanies, after the Greek word translated here appear. Epiphania, which is the noun, you can see it occurs once in 2 Thessalonians, but everywhere else it occurs in the Pauline corpus is in the pastorals. And then we have the verb epiphanein occurs only in Titus in the Pauline corpus. So Gorman says that... Titus is written between the epiphanies, Christ's first appearance and his final appearance at the parousia. This is eternally true. We continue to live between the two epiphanies. We continue to live between the appearance of Christ in history and we continue to look forward to his appearance at the parousia in the second coming at the end of time. This, of course, is something the church draws particular attention to during the season of Advent helps to explain what this reading is doing at Midnight Mass. So that is the letter to Titus. In our last two classes of the course, we're going to look at the letters outside the Pauline corpus. We're going to look at Hebrews very briefly, and then we're going to look at the Catholic letters even more briefly. Until then, read well and pray well.